Le Sommet international de l'éducation du futur réunit une soixantaine de conférenciers du monde entier. Des pionniers et des innovateurs issus du monde de l'éducation, bien évidemment, mais également des êtres inspirants, issus des chemins de sagesse ou des chemins d'apprentissage et de créativité dans différents domaines. Les arts, les sciences, l'économie, le lien avec la nature, le sport, etc. Des expériences et des chemins de vie qui sont un formidable enrichissement pour le monde de l'éducation. Le professionnalisme des traductions, en simultané, et l'incroyable richesse de toutes ces conférences offre un horizon de point de vue vaste et varié, très complet, qui en font au final une véritable formation professionnelle pour les enseignants, les éducateurs et tous les professionnels de l'éducation, mais également une formation à la parentalité consciente et une formation individuelle à la vie consciente. Face à toute cette richesse et aux divers retours, nous avons décidé d'offrir toutes ces conférences à tous, partout dans le monde en français et en anglais, quelquefois en allemand et en espagnol. Découvrez la vision d'acteurs audacieux et influents du changement, vers un monde éthique, solidaire, généreux et profondément respectueux de tous, des cultures, des peuples, des règnes et de la planète. Un incroyable panel de conférences, couvrant toutes les dimensions de l'éducation, pour un futur ayant du sens, une humanité épanouie et une terre qui respire. Une chose est sûre, votre vie, et à travers vous, celle des enfants, ne sera plus la même après avoir écouté toutes ces conférences. Pour avancer, nous avons besoin de vous. Nous avons besoin de votre générosité solidaire. L'organisation du sommet et l'édition des conférences ont nécessité des milliers d'heures de travail et nécessitent encore beaucoup de temps et d'investissement. Nous faisons appel aux dons libres et spontanés pour compléter le financement du sommet et, si possible, continuer à l'enrichir de nouvelles conférences. Votre soutien est vraiment précieux et vital pour aller jusqu'au bout de cette aventure extraordinaire. Merci. Devdeep, thank you very much to be here. Thank you, Devdeep. Um, thank you very much, Abel, for organizing this. Uh, you've been working on it since one year. And when I met uh, Abel, he was insisting that we really need to get someone from the from our school. I've also grown up at the Shobindo International Center of Education in Pondicherry. And uh, I immediately thought of uh, Devdeep. I think uh, it's really important to, for the world to see that uh, I think Devdeep is uh, just a few years elder to me, but like he's uh, really, really well read on the different books of Shubhendu and the mother. And he's, uh, he's an ashramite. So he's a resident of the Shubhendu ashram the spiritual community that was started by the mother and Shrobindo. So the mother is also the founder of uh, Auroville and Shrobindo is the Indian philosopher, sage, freedom fighter. And, um, and Devdeep has been teaching at uh, the Shrobindo ashram since uh, two decades and He offers courses on social and political philosophy of Shrabindo, and he's also an, uh, a teacher on Indian history and art and culture. And uh, today he's going to share with us some of his thoughts on the philosophy and practice of integral education as developed, as developed by Shrabindo. And uh, I'm very curious to hear what Devdeep Dave has to share with us. He's uh, a grown up most of my life, like till the age of 21 with Devdeep. We shared a few months at, uh, in boarding together. And then uh, I also took some classes with him. And I'm very curious now to attend again one of your classes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abhinav. That's a very kind introduction. And uh, indeed, I remember 
the time we have spent together in pondicherry it's an honor for me really to present uh, and share with all of you something about the integral education that uh, evolved here in pondicherry and to to i think able was very keen that i present this session in a more experiential manner talk more about the experience of growing up and teaching there and so on rather than fo to focus on the theory so what i would do is to try and tell you a little bit about integral education through the history of the school but also by sharing a little bit about what it felt like growing up here and then now teaching here uh, as abhinav said for almost two decades so um the interesting um thing about the school here so it's formally known as the shri aurobindo international center of education we just call it very amongst ourselves as the ashram school and as the name suggests the interesting thing is that it is part and parcel of the shri aurobindo ashram and what an ashram means i'm sure most of you are aware but in case we have some uh, persons who may not uh, have the context an ashram is the home of a spiritual master the home of a teacher and in our case we have two teachers or two masters and the first one was shri aurobindo he was born aurobindo ghosh he was born in bengal he had his uh, early and he, you know he he, just, he had his education in england he went to cambridge and uh, he was his family his father wanted him to join the british civil service to come back to india and join the british civil service but already he had ideas about british rule in india and how that was fundamentally flawed and how the there had to be a a fight against it and so he did not do that he came back to india and for a certain number of years plunged into a very deep learning of indian language and languages and culture and an understanding of where he had come from because he was cut off from it having grown up in england and so he spent a good 10 to 12 years immersed in a deep exploration of indian thought and culture and then played a very important role in the freedom movement against the british he was one of the first people to declare openly that uh, independence for india had to be in a complete form and not in any partial sense but we don't want to focus too much on his on his life but just to say that he then when he he was arrested during his revolutionary period he spent a year in jail and in jail he had a series of very powerful spiritual experiences and eventually it became clear to him that the independence of the country was assured it was a question of time and that there was a greater greater slavery in a sense of human nature that had to be fought against and a greater liberation of the human spirit and so he came to pondicherry and he remained here for 40 years till his passing in 1950 and in these 40 years a community grew around him which eventually became the shri aurobindo ashram and a very important uh, role in the growth in the growth of this community was played by the person we refer to as the mother she was mira alfasa a french a uh, lady who came to india uh the first time in 1914 but then in 1920 the interesting thing is tomorrow 24th april is 102 years of the mothers coming to pondicherry and settling there so it's a it's a it's it's a very interesting date that we are discussing this as well in a few hours it will be the 24th of april in india here so the mother comes here and when she is here gradually she she becomes the dynamic force in action of shrobindo's uh, uh work and the ashram the community that grows around him starts to form in the early period the focus of the small community of about 100 people that was living in pondicherry is completely turned towards the spiritual practice 
inner growth sadhana as we call it in india uh, of shrobindo's yoga and it is a few years later during the second world war that some disciples came to pondicherry with their children and these disciples requested the mother if the children could be kept here in pondicherry while the war in the course of the war because they were concerned about the safety of their families and so the mother agreed and then the children came into an environment in which there had never been any children before and so it was a very strange meeting of worlds these very very serious sincere focused individuals completely tuned to their spiritual practice and now suddenly very young children full of energy running around bringing in a, a new kind of life and energy in the atmosphere and so the mother said it is not fair that the children have to follow the strict discipline of ashram life since they had not come out of their own choice their own volition and so a school was was organically started in 1943 so in 1943 the ashram school begins and what the mother is very clear is that from the beginning she says if we are having a school it should not be simply a repetition of the old forms of education now all of you are involved in many interesting experiments in education so you do not need me to tell you about all that is wrong with conventional education but she was clear that she wanted the ashram school to from the very beginning to be to 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 have a completely different orientation so that's how the ashram school begins and it still survives it still exists and grows and flowers and recently a few years back we celebrated 75 years of the ashram school the first children those first children who came running around playing for whom the school started they are the oldest generation of people now living in the ashram so in fact the the registrar of the school the principal of the school manojda and the person in charge of the college jhumurdi these are all individuals whom we all know we have had the uh, you know good fortune of know, knowing them and being taught by them they were the first children in the for whom the school began so that's a very interesting sort of cycle that we are able to see in our own lifetimes they are of course old very old uh, but uh, they are still active to the extent that they can be they are in their mid to late 80s now so um i want to start by saying a little bit about shrobindo's uh, understanding and vision of integral yoga because integral education flows directly from integral yoga and so the word yoga as most of you i'm sure again are aware means a union with the divine with the ultimate or absolute reality this is an old conception in india and for thousands of years we could say that the central aspiration of india the most important sort of guiding principle has been to try and discover and unite with this ultimate absolute reality to overcome the false identification with the ego to some greater truth of our being and many have been the approaches and paths and processes and methods that have been discovered and practiced in india um at a certain stage there came about an association that spirituality meant a withdrawal from life and the reason for that is because while it is possible to have profound experiences profound realizations while it is possible to ascend very high in one's consciousness human nature the the body the emotions the feelings the the, the thoughts the mind the each of these have certain limitations which are very hard to overcome and so there was a tendency in indian spirituality over over many thousands of years it may not have been there in the beginning but it certainly grew with time and this tendency was to believe that if you wanted spiritual perfection it was not possible to do it in life you had to withdraw into the forest 
to the Himalayas in the mountains. You had to move away from life in order to find the higher truth. And this is a very strong association, even to, to, to some extent in India of today. Spirituality means a giving up of life, renunciation. Now, what is interesting in the in, in the mother in the coming together of the mother and Shrobindo and forming this new understanding of yoga is that the opposite tendency predominate predominated in the West a hundred say a hundred years or two hundred years ago, namely a fascination with the material reality, a perfection of the material reality to believe in the existence of the material reality at the cost of anything higher. And it is the joining together of these two ends or two ends of the spectrum that is attempted in the integral yoga. To be able to bring down that highest consciousness, that realization of absolute reality and truth into the most material part of our existence, to change the body, the emotions, the mind, not to associate spirituality with the withdrawal, nor to get so lost in the manifestation, to get so lost in the material world that we forget who we are in our inmost self. So the integral yoga of Sri is called integral because it takes up all the paths of who we are as a person takes up the physical body, the emotions, the mind, and the being, the, the soul within, and the, the self above, all of these different aspects of our personality, which are well known in various spiritual traditions in India and elsewhere, are all taken up and integrated and transformed altogether. So this is the integral yoga of Sri which leads us to integral education. So for the mother, we go back to the year now to 1943 when the school began and her vision for an education, which would take up all these different aspects. A question arises, what is understood by integral? And I have had discussions with many people and around the world, it's a word which is being used more and more integral, integral education, integral life, integral uh, wisdom. The word can be understood in many different ways. For example, to look at a subject from many different points of view is a kind of integrality. But the word integral understood in the vision of the mother and Sri is is somewhat different because there is a principle of integration that which is able to harmonize all these different parts. That principle of integration is known in the terminology of the mother as the psychic being. The psychic being at Sishik in French is the uh, soul within us. And she says, when she writes about the psychic being, she says, it doesn't matter what name you give it. It doesn't matter how you, you speak about it or how you conceptualize it. Many, many experiences and realizations and traditions know about its existence. They speak about the soul within. And this is the element which can integrate these different parts in us. So um, the... When the, school, when the school began, Shravindu said something very, very inspiring. He said, we do not want brilliant students, but living souls. And this living soul, you could say, is the aim of the educational system here. And um, how can we evolve an education for the soul? So that is something I will take up a little later. I will also take up the role of the teacher. And um, I want to, before I come to that, I want to talk a little bit about what it was to come to the ashram school when I was nine years old from a very conventional setup. So I had my early education in, in Bombay, in Mumbai, and in New Delhi. And then at the age of nine, I came to the ashram school. And there was a sense of tremendous um, 
freedom and liberation because there are some interesting features of the ashram school that i will now highlight which are not essential but important to create the overall atmosphere for example the fact that the mother did not believe in exams so to me that was a feeling of great uh, liberation because i in the indian educational system is a tremendous stress on exams and the passing of exams and the getting of marks and to to come to the to come to the uh, ashram and feel suddenly free from the pressure there is no concept there was no concept of passing or failing every year you went up to the next class so there was no way that you would be uh, you know you 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 can be seen as a failure in that sense then i found it remarkable that we had to learn so many languages in the ashram school we do all our sciences physics chemistry mathematics biology in french and we study the humanities english and geography in english and in addition to that we must learn our mother tongue which is any any of the many languages of india or an international language and we must also learn sanskrit which is the ancient one of the ancient languages of india that is used for a lot of traditional knowledge wisdom and systems so four languages were compulsory and then i found it really interesting that the teachers when i came here it struck me that the, my teachers were referred to as older brothers or sisters and not sir or ma'am which is often how they are referred to in schools in india and that was again something which struck me because i found that um the relationship that we developed with with these individuals around us was much more special than just someone coming to do their job and so these were some of the things that struck me and as i grew older i began to appreciate more and more ways in which this subtle spiritual teaching was transmitted in the ashram and one of the first things i want to stress upon is that how we understand soul education in the ashram is that it is not something that can be taught through any fixed method or form it cannot be imposed it cannot be uh, taught in a setting of a classroom where everyone is you know uh, sits together and says we have to now discover our souls it is an atmosphere a presence an example which is essential and so in the early period of the ashram school of course the mother's physical presence was here and she used to often take many of the classes she guided many of the teachers we have an extensive correspondence of letters exchanged between the mother and the students between the mother and the teachers and this is something very fascinating and it still exists they are published in the form of in, in you know in the form of a book which i will share with you at the end of my session and this volume on education is a beautiful guide for all of us who are trying to evolve new approaches to education and an important stress in that volume which comes out is that ultimately the teacher must be himself or herself a practitioner a yogi the truths of the inner worlds cannot be taught in mental terms they must be lived and the influence and presence of the teacher is more important than what you say with your mouth and this is an approach which was stressed upon in the ashram as we grew up and we felt always that there was something special in the atmosphere i felt that there was something special in the atmosphere uh, we were part and parcel of the larger ashram community all our teachers were were volunteers they were not getting a salary to teach us none of the ashram teachers are paid to teach the students do not pay to learn and so there is no transactional nature in the education the entire atmosphere is one where you have you have uh, adults who wish to volunteer 
who whose whose needs are either taken care of by the community or they have their own means and resources to look after their needs but one way or the other it's not a career for which the teachers come to the ashram school to teach and so the whole atmosphere changes because there's no question of a promotion or you don't have to prove something to someone it is all about your own journey of discovery as you go along and similarly for the students you realize that there is no there is no entitlement possible there is no sense of obligation you are there because you are in an atmosphere of growth and progress and the progress that you make depends entirely on how much you are willing to make use of the environment there is a beautiful sentence of the mother where she says and i'm quoting she says the will for the great discovery should be always there above you above what you do and what you are like a huge bird of light dominating all the movements of your being it's as if it it is not so much there was a teacher who asked the mother we will teach the children the subjects you you please look after the spiritual side of the education and the mother's response is very interesting she says this is what i am trying to break this division that there is spiritual and non spiritual that there are spiritual subjects and not spiritual subjects she says everything every activity of human life every aspect of education can be taught through a sense of awareness and consciousness and that is what it means to transmit spirituality it doesn't matter what you are doing what matters is how you are doing it with what sense of uh can uh, inner connection you are able to do that activity and so it is a very uh, it's a very vast field to talk about spirit, spiritual education in detail uh, uh, is is a work of a it's a work of a lifetime firstly to practice it and then to speak of it also requires a certain mastery oneself now another thing which struck me as a student is when i was growing older uh we had we had the choice when we were 15 14 or about 15 or 16 to choose what was known as the free progress system and the free progress system was an experimental section of the school because the school is always up to many different experiments so we were part of one such experiment and this experiment was to to take a group of children who are interested and to say that you do not have a fixed timetable no emploi emploi du temps which is fixed you have to determine what you would like to study how much you would like to study and even later on with whom you would like to study and so this was something which was very new and very interesting and there were each of us were allotted a guide an older teacher who was a kind of mentor to the student and the the mentors would kind of help the students to make some of those choices but ultimately the choice was the students and so this was also a very interesting feature of the education here the the sense of freedom and for a lot of people this freedom is what attracts them to integral education and yet and yet i feel that this concept of freedom is often misunderstood when i speak with other educators in 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 even in the ashram school but also elsewhere we have debates on what we understand by freedom for example should we tell a child of 6 or 7 years that you can do what you want and that's part of your education is that freedom uh does freedom mean simply being able to choose your subjects does does that choice is that choice the highest expression of freedom so this is a very subtle and interesting notion the idea of the the idea of freedom is essential for the development of the soul but we often forget that freedom is closely related to discipline freedom is closely related to will for example when we choose who makes the choice 
what in us makes the choice if that choice is made from the inmost part of our being that is truly freedom if the choice is dictated by a mental prejudice or a desire of the being is it really freedom can we call it freedom so i had a very interesting interaction with a student of mine i teach at the older section at the college level so these are children in the age group of 18 to 21 so already at the age of 18 they have a lot of outer freedom no 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 fixed subjects no fixed teachers they make their own timetable that that freedom to do so is imposed you do not have a choice not to be free when you reach that age group that i teach at so it's already quite old the students are mostly on their own but i had a student in one of my classes who though he had signed up for my class used to often miss it and this particular class was fixed for the afternoon you know in india where we live in the in the southern part of india it's very hot in summer avinav will remember we've all been through that and we have very long days and so in the afternoon sometimes when we have the break after lunch you sometimes sleep and then you have to have a certain will power to say i have to follow the discipline so what was interesting about this particular student is that he was very bright he was very capable but he used to keep sleeping often miss the class and he was very honest that's again something that we we insist on in the ashram school be truthful whatever is the reason you share it openly and so he used to invariably tell me it's feeling too sleepy i didn't come i was asleep i couldn't wake up and so one day i told him look i want to understand do you put an alarm how is it possible that you miss so many classes and and he used to say he really enjoyed the classes so it's not as if he didn't want to come so i said do you put an alarm and he said yes i put an alarm and so i asked him look what happens so the alarm rings you wake up from your bed and then at that moment what happens and he told me something interesting he said there is no will i know what i have to do but there is no will and this was for me as a teacher a uh, a profound sort of moment of understanding uh, of of a concept which i mentally understood but i could then really see it in myself as well that to truly be free one must also have absolute control over oneself one must have the ability to exercise the highest will of our being true freedom is not satisfaction of whatever we want to do it is not satisfaction of the lower impulses of of the desires of the the feeling of the moment true freedom is when we are free from the impulsion of the lower nature and so the more one liberates oneself the less one is bound to one's nature so in a in a sort of paradoxical sense liberation is a freedom of you from yourself of you from your lower self and what i realize when i look at how the mother structured the school and how it has evolved over time is that it's an evolving freedom the more the child grows the greater the choices are at a younger age it is not as if children are, are left free to do whatever they want there is a discipline we are taught equally the value of discipline as we grow older there is more freedom as we have more freedom there is more scope for inner growth to take place so this is again another thing that i wish to highlight and here i want to bring in another important aspect of integral education which is physical education and physical education is the education of the body which the mother laid a lot of stress upon every day we had to compulsorily do two hours of uh, what you would call sports and different 
events, different items, no specialization permitted. So one day may be swimming, the next day would be athletics, a third day would be gymnastics, a fourth day would be a number of various games like basketball and football or hockey. And so again, even here, the mother changed the whole approach from playing sports in order to you know, distract oneself to playing sports in order to use the energies in a productive way to become more conscious of oneself and ultimately to develop the body as an instrument for a higher purpose. And so even here, slowly these ideas were introduced in a non-didactic way without any kind of uh, uh, imposition of any sort. So the stress on physical education meant that though we were doing sports every day, we were also, we also understood that it was not about, it was not only about competing with others, but competing with oneself. A lot of stress was given on how much progress have you made that year more than have you come first. So our coaches would always say, how much are you, how much faster are you running? How much further are you jumping? How much more are you able to lift if you do weightlifting rather than how are you vis-a-vis -vis or compared to others? And here, once again, the ideal was changed, uh, was, was attuned to a higher purpose. Um, there is a very beautiful sentence, which I like, and it goes like this. The greatness of a person is the greatness of the impersonal in him. And what it, what to me, what it means is that the more you individualize yourself, the more you universalize yourself. In other words, the more you are able to make that inner part of the being, the leader of the education, the more that takes the lead and that integrates the other parts of the being, the more we actually become universal, wide, capable of higher growth and progress. So these are some of the, I would say, important aspects of integral education and also some of the uh, experiences I had of being a student. Now I want to talk a little bit about my experience of being a teacher. So when I finished my education at the Ashram School in the year 2004, I, uh, in, in the years that I was in college, I was very drawn to reading the various books of Shurabindu. And these, these books, he wrote on a number of topics, ranging from, Shurabindu wrote on books, range, uh, on, wrote on topics ranging from philosophy to culture, to politics, to, to you know, understanding world events from a deeper perspective, poetry, uh, literature, so, and of course, the practice of yoga. And so I became quite keenly interested in some of these some of these readings. And so when I finished my college, I was drawn to uh, continue remaining in the ashram community. And where I was allotted work in one of the departments. So the ashram is a community of about 2000 people, which in, by which I'm including the students as well. And um, all the activities of life are present in the ashram, meaning we grow our own food. So we have the farms, we have the, the, the facilities to look after people who are unwell or who are old. So there are medical departments. Then of course there is the school. Then there are all the things that you need for day-to-day -day life, like tailoring or a bakery for bread or a laundry to wash clothes or um, uh, a department to look after your cycles because we all cycle around here in Pondicherry. Pondicherry is a small town. Of course, now it's it has grown and it's growing very fast, but it has been you, traditionally a small town. And so all of these are part of the life of the ashram. And growing up 
we the ashram school was very much a part of the life of the community as well and so uh, this also provided a very interesting interaction now for me I, uh, along with my work in one of the ashram departments i was also asked to teach and initially i was asked to teach along with an older teacher and substituting him and then i got my own classes as well and so being a teacher was an interesting transition for me to look at what was to look at my experience from the other side of the of the door so to say and i realized the extent to which it was not so much about how much you knew that mattered rather than who you are of course you needed to know your subject but if you want respect from students or if you want to to teach or you would like your students to behave in a certain way it it hardly matters what you tell them what matters much more is how they perceive you and whether they are able to see in you what you want them to do so these were some interesting learnings um and because i teach older students it was also important for me to see that what i wanted from them namely the enthusiasm to learn the sense of curiosity a wanting a willingness to read and know about the subjects i was teaching about and i realized if i wanted to see those things in them i would have to inculcate them in myself as well and so for me to become a teacher in a in a in an interesting way was to become a student and uh, in that sense my education i always feel has just begun and continues to feel i continue to feel as if i have just begun because there is a, con, con, a growing and continuing sense of so much learning that has to be done of so much mastery that has to be achieved and the more you go forward the more you realize how much remains to be done and integral education to me is thus not so much is not only about teaching children but also an approach to life and that is how the whole educational approach of mother and shobindo is closely related to the practice of their yoga as well now what i was thinking is now we've i have been speaking for about 40 minutes and i uh, was wondering it would be nice to hear a little from abhinav because our experiences Uh, are very in complementary in the sense that we both grew up in the ashram school, and uh, as Abhin have mentioned, just a few years gap between uh, between us. And uh, I have lived all my life in Pondicherry. After I came here, I have continued to live here. And though I do move about once in a while, but I have basically been stationed in Pondicherry. And Abhin have has had the a uh, opportunity to engage with the world outside in a much more uh, involved manner and to really bridge uh, his experience and his understanding uh, between the ashram and what he has seen outside and one thing i must say before i uh, you know leave some the you know give the the parol to avinav is um that so many people tell us something that i hear a lot is that when they meet ashram students they say we don't know what it is there is something different we're not able to put our finger on it but there is something different and i don't want to give the impression as if each one of us who has come out of the ashram school is somehow special or changed or transformed it is absolutely untrue the school itself is a work in progress we are all as individuals a work in progress and yet in spite of all our imperfections and limitations something of the presence of this place something of the touch of mother and shobindo uh comes into our life and it shapes the way that we see things and the way that we live so i i would i am also eagerly looking forward to hearing from abhinav uh, his 
uh, experience of the world uh, outside and how he bridges these two realities please abhinav thank you very much uh, devdeep it was really uh, inspiring and like it, it was like it's just yesterday that i was there in pondicherry so i could really relate to everything that you shared uh, but i think you're uh, probably cheating a little <laughs> because you had 20 minutes more <laughs> no no but oh. i'm very no no you, you yeah. have we have all the time so uh, i'll be yeah, we can we can go back and forth actually Absolutely. so once you uh, maybe you shared what you would like and then i can come back again i still have some points of course and uh, <laughs> I, i i feel it i feel it always becomes more interesting when it's a little more absolutely yes. so um i i think what i so like um, you had mentioned about the free system so i think you were also part of it and uh, i was also part of it for for 3 years and i think i think that was uh, those 3 years were like very important that into who i am today and uh, through these 3 years what i learned was also of of learning how to learn and it was how also important for you so how old were you then um 15 16 17 or uh, 16 17 18 and um, and especially to the inspiring teachers that we had uh uh we also had uh, teachers from canada from france and of course uh, indian teachers who and these teachers were like experts on every subject you could just go and ask them any question from math science physics and uh, they could answer and i remember there there was uh, this uh, canadian couple called louis and louise and so i was interested in 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 i was going to louise to learn french and uh, i was also interested in urbanization and and so she through playing uh, a, a game like sim city she at the same time helped me understand about urbanization building cities having a systemic thinking while speaking to me in french and on the other side uh, louis who uh, he was an expert into automation and economics and uh, so before i met louis i was interested in to astronomy so i think the first 6 months like you said we could choose all our subjects the teachers the time we wanted to spend so i started uh, building a telescope through which i learned about the everything about lenses convex concave lenses how do you calculate the focal length and uh, i went to different teachers to find out got ordered uh, a piece of glass to get it make a lens and do a, uh, astronomy i was also interested in to i wanted to become i think at that age uh, an astronaut uh but then so i used to do a lot of research in that domain and then uh, something changed i don't remember i wanted to become uh, i wanted to, to become like uh, I, i was like into reverse engineering and trying to understand code and become like a hacker so like as to just be into code and then when i met louis i uh, i was inspired by uh, economics and automation and uh, like someone at his level with his expertise he could like make things simple and explain to me of what it is and so i could really uh, so through these 3 years actually what i also learned was how to search for information either by asking the right questions and going to the right people looking for the information or at that time uh, internet was just starting and so learning to write the right questions to learn by myself and uh, liberty is like devdeep says uh, is also comes with a lot of responsibility so i had some colleagues who uh, didn't know how to uh, manage that liberty and that time and so they they did waste a lot of their time which later they regretted i too had those moments of uh, just being able to like uh, devdi mentioned it's a question of will power so i did have uh, all the free time to do what i wanted to do and uh, i did through discipline i had that constraint of being 
uh, there in the afternoon when it was hot, but I could also just sleep. Like no one was really there to to really check if I'm there or not. So I think this giving it was more like creating a playground with rules which needed to be followed, and within these rules, we could do what we wanted. And today, like I'm also a little in that role of a teacher, like I'm a trainer in uh, companies on innovation. And I'm into uh, training around frugal innovation, which is innovating with constraints. And once these constraints are set, you just see that we can innovate and we have all the liberty uh, through these constraints. Liberty without any constraints is uh, is paralyzing. And uh, just what, a last point, like you said, it is difficult in the outside world to live with these convictions and values that we've grown up. Like people sometimes look at you like, uh, okay, you're, you come from another universe. And I think Abel can probably also uh, put in a word because like Abel is probably one of those few people that I met here who's like, like when we speak of karma yoga or service or like doing something without thinking of the fruit, I have not met that many people. And I think I probably also like seeing Abel in action. We had a little project of creating a little eco village and like seeing Abel do permaculture or like organize this conference and just doing an action for the action and not even thinking about the outcome. Uh, like I, I re-remembered like everything that uh, we had uh, learned, but like practicing that in the real world is difficult. <laughs> If, you, if if I can delve deep, I can I can answer also your questions because I spent one year and a, and a half at the Sri Lombido Yoga Mandir in Nepal, you know, and 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 when I came back here in France and I met uh, uh, Habinav and Pranav, his brother, I, I feel something. I, I feel what is the difference, and the difference is that that they are not working. For realize for realization, social realization or individual realization, they are working for the earth. They are working for the humanity. You know, it's a, it's a gift. Working is a gift. It's not to to to. It's not to to take something or to obtain something. It's just a gift. And it's it's deep. It's really deep. And this is a, a profound difference I can see with the uh, in the world between the people who are coming from this uh, background of education and the others. You know, there is no personal will; it's just give. And and so and so another difference is to go with the things as they as they are. No fighting the, the life. Just going with the life as it is, and no problem. It's like this, okay. And this is it's it's really deep. I can see with the people who was who came from this kind of education. We can see it for the for those for the people who have the eyes. They can see it for the others. They don't understand. They said. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, what Abel was saying, like I've uh, we've had we've spent a lot of time together and a few months, and I think uh, what we also through the what Devdeep mentioned as the as integral education being uh, an education of the soul, I think uh, in the outside world uh, we are scared to pronounce the word spirituality where we confuse spirituality and uh, religion. But I think it's a question of faith. And uh, what uh, Abel is saying that if we have faith, we know that 
uh, at the end uh, all is well something is going to uh, come up a solution will uh, come up from somewhere it's just uh, a belief so devdeep if uh, you want to comment on what was said and there's also a question do you see any convergence between the education system at sic and the direction which the traditional education system is moving towards and if from your experience from other systems of education like montessori steiner or any mm. other you want to make a link so um one thing which is definitely clear is that more and more people from conventional traditional educational systems are opening up and are recognizing the importance of new forms of education we receive in the ashram school every year literally hundreds of teachers coming from universities colleges schools conventional schools and usually it is always one or two teachers who have been touched and they would like to introduce their colleagues to a different way of looking at things we have in recent years we have also been receiving teachers from government schools this is a very new and inspiring thing that is happening in india teachers from the different states of india as some of you would know india is composed of many different states it's a very diverse country and the quality of life and the levels of literacy and education vary significantly depending on which part of india you go to but what is happening is that some of the more progressive states or the states that want to make progress are actively sending their teachers to introduce them to what's happening in other places and we receive sometimes teachers from government schools and you know the situation in government schools in india some for some of these teachers it's a tremendous uh, you have to have a tremendous sense of service if you want to do your job well because your resources are limited numbers are very high you get children from very it's not always but sometimes from underprivileged backgrounds and so it is inspiring to see how more and more there is a growing desire in people aspiration in people to open to new forms of education so this is one side of it the other aspect of this question is the policy aspect and uh, just just a few years ago india released what is known as the new education policy the new education policy was something which has been in work for many years and of course it's a government education policy you can't expect it to be uh, you know uh, re- revolutionary in the spiritual sense and yet it is revolutionary because it really tries its best to think of some kind of new paradigm for education at a national level and at least uh, in the formation of that education policy we had many of the people who were involved in drafting it visiting the ashram school talking to our teachers seeing what is being done here and so that is also something uh, which is interesting so i feel these centers like the ashram school and i know that there are many places around the world this conference itself is living proof of that that there are educators and schools in many places around the world which is which who are trying to bring about new forms of growth and learning trying to place that which is within in front and these become like little centers of inspiration the influence that they have goes beyond just the immediate surroundings and the more you have people or such institutions trying to make change even if it feels very small see we are a small school the ashram school only gra- there are only thir- at most 25 to 30 graduates a year which is nothing it's a drop in the ocean and yet at at a deeper level the effect of that is much more than just a numerical effect and so i think to answer this question this convergence is not something that we can expect to see in a very short term 
a short period of our of time but it is definitely something that is moving in that direction and so i am optimistic in any case by nature i am optimistic but i do believe that this is this is happening um in terms of comparisons or in to see it in in, in comparison to other systems like the world of schools and so on i think everyone is all of these uh, educational systems or or um, movements who are trying in their own way to understand the world and the the role of the individual in the world from some deeper perspective we we will always find lots of commonalities if you look for differences in approach certainly differences in approach will be there and that is healthy that is good because the world is made up of so many different kinds of people people have different needs and uh, there is no one method or approach that can work even in the ashram school itself we have so many debates among teachers bet- between how free progress should be implemented what age it should be implemented what does it truly mean and i think the fact that we are engaged with these questions irrespective of whether we we feel we have the right answers or not it doesn't matter the fact that these questions are being raised and we are talking about it means that we are moving in the right direction and so that is what uh, that's how i would answer this there is another point i want to make and um you know there is a saying that you need a village to educate a child and i feel one of the very precious things that we have in pondicherry in the ashram school is the community and i can't highlight that enough sometimes we think so much about education in terms of infrastructure buildings technology training not that these things are not important they are important and if you have them so much the better but what makes a school special i feel is the environment in which it grows just like a plant a flower needs the right environment children need the right environment and when you are when you are able to create an atmosphere of of progress of growth of joy of love children respond to it and i think that is something that the more we think about education and schools sometimes teachers from conventional schools ask us how do we implement these ideas in our setup because we can't we can't say no exams we can't say uh, no salaries or no fees they come from conventional systems so one thing which i my, my view is that i fully understand those challenges but if an atmosphere or a, a feeling is created where you shift the importance given to things where you say okay much more than how many marks you have got i want you to think in terms of how much progress you have made these subtle shifts of psychological self awareness can have a very tremendous role if if the system is constraining so the, the sense of community within courts is also very important i feel there is a comment here on the side uh les choses sont en train de bouger uh, c'est pourquoi il y a autant de déséquilibre ces nouveaux mouvements bouleversent les ordres établis qui rentrent en résistance avec leur propre interdit so i think i think there's definitely uh, uh, something to that um, and this is true for the world in general whenever something new has to manifest something new has to come about it is always a period of great uh transition a period of great uh, change and disorder and um um it's in a sense also a moment of hope because then change can happen it's if you think about the mother and shobindo's own lives when the uh mother was in paris part of certain groups or societies that were really interested in these esoteric spiritual questions it was just before the first world war and um 
of course then she came to pondicherry in 1920 and then you you she was here through the second world war and so in their own life the mother and shobindo lived through very difficult moments of global history and it is also a time when so many fundamental shifts of of nature of consciousness are taking place and i think that this this uh, du- duality is important to recognize the more things change the more resistance and and uh, destabilization disharmony we are likely to see and that is not a sign for despair it is actually a sign a, re- a reminder for us to really anchor ourselves in the most important uh, deepest part of our being and to work towards the change that we want to see in the world um now we we have uh, abel we have another uh, 15 20 minutes right so you're on yes, mute yes yes we 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 have a a good uh, 20 to 30 minutes okay great so i was thinking that this is a good time to uh, introduce a text for people who are interested in integral education and uh, if if it's okay to share my screen and we're not going to read any long passages but i just want to tell people share the, this uh, you know the knowledge of this volume on education which has all the mothers most important letters and correspondences and i th- i think that for those for anyone who is interested in a deeper integral or spiritual education this is a very important reading and for us uh, who are teaching it's something that you have to keep going back to in spite of knowing the text a little bit so i will share the screen so that you can all have a have a look at it Devdi, Just, Devdi, yes you you, yes. Have, you have to be uh, careful that when we are reading we are speaking faster so for yes. the for, for the translator you have to read slowly yes breathing yes. so <laughs> it's not too right. fast for them you are right yes and i i will tr- i don't intend to read too much but i will keep that in mind um so let me share the screen now so this is called voila i'm sharing the english version but this text is also available in french yeah, abhinav yeah, are you yeah. able to see the the material on the screen yeah it's perfect yes yes it's, and if you can put the the links to for english and french also it will be nice for the people i'll i'll put it okay great great so this is the mother on education the mother of pondicherry all all her different writings and commentaries her talks on education so i'm going to go down to the table of contents it's this is volume 12 of the collected works of the mother because she has many different volumes of uh, writing that's picture of the mother in 1969 just a few years before her passing she was in her early 90s mid 90s actually and around the time that orville was just had just started and it's quite remarkable when you think about the fact that the project of orville was launched when she was already well into her 90s that gives you a sense of just how much dynamism and action she was able to put into force even in spite of her uh, age and the fact that she was not moving around at that point sorry that was a bit of a diversion we'll come back to the table of contents so now i will show you here so there are different parts in this book the first part is a series of articles that she had written on education and they are kind of the most important basis uh, of for our understanding of integral education so here for example she speaks about the different uh, uh the, the different planes of our being so physical education vital education mental education psychic and spiritual education so when we say integral education it is a development of all of these led by the psychic that is the sort of the 
the the key the the door which opens to everything else and then there are some more articles which are which are interesting for example the four austerities and the four liberations is a very profound text for somebody who really wants to arrive at a very deep mastery of themselves it is really for you can say a text for the aspiring yogi and then i'll go down a bit is in case you are wondering some some of you might wonder what is the problem of woman here she takes up how um you know the mother was somebody who believed in the fundamental equality of the sexes she started in the 19 when when sports took off in the ashram in a big way in the 1950s you must remember in the context of india she did something very radical she got everyone to play in shorts this happened in 1949 and the, when i say everyone i mean boys and girls men and women of all age groups even older women who some of whom came from traditional families wearing sarees she insisted that if that if they wanted to come and participate in the sports in the physical education they would have to wear shorts and come like everyone else and it was a very very significant shift in the way people thought about these things back then and so uh and not just not just the wearing of shorts but also the doing of everything that boys did i think we were playing football in the ashram and various other games uh probably before even then it was popular in many parts of the world like the girls and the women were were involved in all these sports anyway so there's a lot there, there are a few interesting essays on the right way of you know looking at the difference of genders so in the in part 2 of this book you have some messages and letters on different topics like related of course to the ashram school which as we mentioned is known as the shri aurobindo international center of education so you have letters on study reading holidays it's something that i didn't mention we don't have holidays like in conventional schools there's no summer holiday winter holiday festival holidays we have only one and a half months in the year in the whole year when students can choose to um go out there are actually a, a number of them who remain in the school even during that period or they or they go out for maybe 10 days and they stay rest of the time and what is interesting is that it's related to this idea of the atmosphere that you you create an atmosphere where the child feels they don't really feel the need to go and that is again something interesting so anyway you can read about some of those letters there and then she comes to teachers and tests curriculum and so on further down there is a series of letters on physical education anyone who is interested in sports from the point of view of consciousness will find these letters to be extremely pertinent and interesting and again she takes up many different aspects of uh, physical education then some more specific letters about her work in the school and here answers to a monitress and answers to a monitor is a series of letters to a very young teacher a young girl teacher and a young and a young man who were both themselves students and who had started teaching and started coaching children and so they are full of questions themselves about their attitude how they should be teaching these children and they are students themselves and you can see how the mother is working with each individual to lead them to 
a deeper understanding of education and finally at the end you have <clears throat> these conversations which are recorded conversations with groups of teachers on education so like i mentioned even today we have so many debates about what is integral education because remember that integral education is not about a fixed form structure or method it is about a change of consciousness how we arrive at that change of consciousness is interesting because everyone has a different perspective on it and so in a group where everyone is trying to arrive at that same goal somebody will say discipline is more important somebody will say freedom is more important somebody will say how do we balance the two and so even then you had teachers who were debating these issues and so these conversations with her about various aspects of education are very illuminating as well at the very end of the book in part 3 are three dramas that the mother wrote for the children because the children would put up a program every year for the annual function and these these dramas were written by her and she even directed these plays for a few years and she helped the actors what is remarkable about the mother's working in the school is that always her stress was on using every activity as a means of self growth not looking at the activity itself as important but as a means for self growth and that is something which is a constant reminder for ourselves as well so um i that, that's a, that's a text and i will uh, i can maybe um share this uh, pdf i will put the link uh, maybe abhinav has already done it i don't know um uh, yeah i found uh, it yes. on google yes. i just put it great 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 so so yes so then it's uh, available to whoever wants wants to to read it yeah thank you so much zeedeep i think uh, that's like a great manual with really practical and day to day uh, question and answers that i think uh, all the educators parents that are present uh, today yes find uh, very useful yes so i think i i've kind of covered a lot of ground today and i <laughs> feel that we can we we can continue speaking about different aspects but to end with i just want to um briefly sort of summarize what we have seen in this session so we started with a broad understanding of shrobindo's life and a little bit about the mother and then how they came to pondicherry and then how the ashram slowly grew around them this community of seekers which is what an ashram is and so it began to grow around them and then we saw how during the world war some children came and then the mother wanted from the beginning if you had to have a school for children so if we are starting a school she wanted it to be different from day one and you must remember that the teachers of the school in the early period had all gone through very conventional educations it was a big change for them as well for them to understand that no she that she is wanting a new way of teaching see it's one thing for us like abhinav and i have grown up in a system which is already different so our work is built upon our experiences already as students but these early teachers were strongly formed in conventional systems and for them they had to completely rework and and re-see things in a different light and so that's why i think also this volume that i shared talks about how they are gradually shifting their way of looking at things so then we spoke about how the school developed and i brought in a little bit about the theory of integral education the five parts of the being the principle of integration which is the soul within and 
also the interplay between freedom and discipline because a lot of alternative education focuses on freedom but it's important to remember that freedom of what freedom of the soul to make a choice and until we are conscious of that until we have that conviction of inner choice freedom must also go with discipline and so this understanding which uh, uh, we we shared and finally we both abhinav and i we shared a little bit about our experiences of growing up in the ashram school and for abhinav his his uh, work outside and having to bridge his education and the world outside and for me of being a teacher and seeing the whole thing from the other side and realizing that at the end of the day there is no difference i am still a student and i am still learning and very much uh, an ongoing education uh, for life and so this is broadly the whole field that we have covered in the last uh, one hour and uh, 15 uh, one hour or 20 and 20 minutes almost and uh, uh, i think this is a good good place able to uh, conclude our session and if there yes. are any last questions wait, we wait, can wait wait there is we have we have 2 minutes to answer this because there is there is a nice uh, a nice uh, sentence here because as as in this education there is no uh, certificate are the are the children ready to work outside in the world abi you yeah. can you can answer for this you know because he is an example of this yes so uh, first i'd like to really thank devdeep for uh, taking this time it's like pretty late in india and uh, and also seeing uh, how methodical and structured your approach is <laughs> with the summary so um, with regards to the recognition but i think the question was was different it was like can how can people uh Ah, okay yeah so i did face a few difficulties in uh, in the beginning uh because i wanted to study management and um i i had to give these uh, competitive exams with the outside world and i was i was doing it really half heartedly i knew that i to get into the system i needed to do that uh but eventually so uh, i managed to get like 92 and a half or something percentile for in for one of the schools in bangalore which was a very good school in entrepreneurship and then so i had gone with my uh, with my father we spent two days to get to that um, to uh to come to the school and then i it was time for the interview i went for the interview they just opened the my dossier my files and they said oh where are the mark sheets uh i'm sorry that uh, we cannot entertain you but like we i had gone through a connection to a connection but like i was like so angry and so sad at the same time that like he just didn't give me didn't even give me a chance i was i had and that day i had uh taken uh, an oath <laughs> in a way that i'm going to come back and give a lecture in this school and uh, and then i wanted to change the game uh, the rules of the game and uh, so i came to france so in france uh, it was much easier to to get accepted there was the same questions like in india it, it is competitive and unfortunately it has become a filter to select but i have some of my cl- classmates have gone to the best uh, engineering and management schools so where our students have already gone the doors are wide open and uh, our certificates are accepted and uh, we are all opening doors so like uh, coming to france uh, 3 years back i started giving uh, classes at uh, hec paris which is one of the most respected uh, universities in uh, management in europe and that day i was like uh, 
I told myself that, okay, I have my degree from a respected management school. But uh, my, my brother, he's also done his studies at uh, Essex Business School two years back, and uh, he's done it very well. So certificates are really not an issue where we really want to do or get what we want. Yeah, I think also that, um, as Abhinav says, a, lo a lot of our students, wherever they go, they open doors. And sometimes when people open new doors, it's a bit hard. But then when they go through, uh, invariably, it's almost as if, and in, in some instances, we actually receive requests from a school where a new student has gone. They'll say, do you have some more? Can you send a few more? such students. And so it's quite wonderful to see that. And uh, I think we are lucky also because the world is changing. In the last few years, it has changed even more. And people are suddenly waking up to the idea that it is not essential to have a formal degree. And when one of the key, you know, one of the most important um, learnings for a student in, our, in the ashram is when they become passionate about something. And this is true around the world. When a student really does not need any other motivational incentive, but they just want to learn, learn for the joy of learning, to learn for, for, for knowing more, for growing more. And when people feel that, when they see that, I think that more and more people are open to trying out. So a lot of our students say, look, if you have an entrance exam, let us sit for it or try, or try us out for some time and then see. So even if they do not have a diploma or a degree, and we absolutely don't want to give a diploma or degree in the ashram, because the moment we do that, we fall into the old cycle of education and thinking about education being diplomas and degrees. So they get a paper, which is like a simple one sheet certificate, which says student has spent so many years and they were interested, they have studied these subjects. That's it. No marks, no grades, no comments, nothing. And even with that, they are able to go all over India, all over the world, in so many different industries and modes of work. And uh, more importantly, I think they are able, wherever they go, whatever they do, I think something in them is touched. And they bring about they try, they aspire to bring about a change in themselves and in their environment. And that is really the most precious gift, in a sense, of the school. So, uh, Devdeep, I had a, a question from uh, a, a friend who's a teacher. And uh, they were asking, like, if we go to Pondicherry, like, is it possible to come and learn or spend a few days in the classrooms with other teachers? So uh, I didn't have an That's answer. Nice but... question. Yes. I think um, if a, a teacher is genuinely interested in wanting to understand and learn more and see this in practice, they are certainly welcome. Um, it's not always easy to place a new person in a classroom or in inside, uh, you know, what shall I say? Sometimes they would like to sit in on classes. That is harder because many of these classes are, are spaces where, as you know, the size of our classes are very small. And there are sometimes four, five, six students to one teacher. And so they are very intimate spaces where there's a lot of trust and open discussions and people feel uncomfortable when there is a new person suddenly sitting there and it causes its own problems over time. So nowadays we don't uh, generally allow people to sit in on the class, but what we do is they can see the place, they can spend time on the outside, meaning not in the class, but let's say interacting with teachers interacting with teachers in their field or of their age group. Like I teach older students, there are many, there's some amazing work happening at the younger levels also. So teachers, depending on where, what they're interested in. So we can, we can set up those interactions and they can get a feel of the place by being here. So that is, that is certainly possible. And 
uh devdeep what i remember fondly is also that uh, we one thing was that uh, we had every friday or in the in one of our in the lecture the, in hall of harmony in our lecture rooms like inspiring people from all over the world from diverse mm-hmm. walks of life coming and sharing mm-hmm. their experiences so like um, like what if someone wants to come can they contact you and then oh yes oh yes certainly. organize something certainly certainly so we have we welcome a lot of musicians artists people in the field of uh, say drama or even people who would like to share some you know experience that they have had in terms of a particular work say you know specialization in some field it's, uh, any any inspiring journey whether it's in the form of a lecture or a sharing in terms of um you know in the form of as i said music and dance and so on uh, if it if it can be organized uh within the constraints of the time uh is definitely something that uh, if they would like to share with the children it certainly is most uh, they are most welcome because that's another thing that i think we picked up abhinav is this exposure to so much exposure to so much um, so many different people so many different cultures languages and teachers from different parts of india different parts of the world and i think that's a very important part in having a certain universalized sense of being in the world and so certainly that is also uh, most welcome thank you thank you so much devdeep uh, next year when i come to pondicherry i'll definitely come and see you <laughs> yes sure sure and i might be in 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 paris in a few weeks so i'll look you up if you are there excellent so if uh, anyone who wants to catch up also with devdeep if you want but uh, i'll be looking forward to to meeting you devdeep same you and uh, same you. thank you so much thank, thank you very much for, devdeep it thank was thank you for organizing sorry yes you first oh, it was it was so it was so nice to have you here and to 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 go in a trip with you to the yes. to yes. all these years in the ashram it was very nice yes and thank you for organizing this beautiful uh, you know possibility of sharing and uh, i i i really look forward to uh, you know listening the speakers i have missed later on and also the ones that will be coming in the next few days so thank yes, you very to- much you know tomorrow there will be the yogi of the uh, of nepal who who built the the, ash- the educational ashram of shrobindo and and he, he has an incredible life and he will explain all the strip in the life from the himalaya to to the That's ashram true. it was incredible and 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 the people and the children and the youth of the the ashram will dance also for the work tomorrow oh, nice. you know it's, it's 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 the it's the celebration celebration so after the yes. celebration they will offer dance nepali dance and indian dance for to the world the children and the youth tomorrow very nice so thank we you just everyone. take yes. what I I just said thank you everyone merci beaucoup à tous and uh, yes thank you thank you Devdeep thank you thank you Abhinav